Um, so John Doe, in, uh, I think what is interesting uh, with John Doe's work, and this is why we invited her, um, also came up in the discussions yesterday, is that her own practice is embedded in the urban, uh, both in terms of pedagogy as well as her own uh, practice and research interests. And I think this is where perhaps, I don't know if Dilip is here, uh, but Dilip sort of in, 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 the, in the morning session, but also yesterday, spoke about in some ways giving up cities um, and the idea of, of cities as such. But I think what is interesting in, interesting in this panel, uh, which in some ways also shifts those registers, but also continues the dialogue further, in really thinking of the fact that cities themselves can also be blurry. Yeah, cities themselves can also have uh, that blurriness, that ambiguity within which is located certain sort of affordances of social form. So I think uh, that's what we're interested in John Doe's work and our work as well. We, uh, a lot of the students presented yesterday. And I think what was interesting in the way um, the students spoke about the idea of the urban is that there was no distinction between architecture and the urban. There was a kind of fluidity between the two. And uh, John Doe's own work located in Hong Kong is sort of embedded in that practice. So I, I'd introduce, I would love to uh, invite John Doe to the table. Thank you. So, let's see. This one? Can you hear me? Yeah? Thank you, Rupali, for that in introduction. I, I was also trying to remember the first time where and how I met Rupali. I mean, our, our paths have intersected, I would say, many times over the past decade, 12 years, 13 years. And then uh, we remember the, the first time we met was at uh, Amsterdam. Uh, it was a conference in Amsterdam. And it was a conference on India and China. So was a few Chinese, was a lot of Indian scholars uh, speaking about China, India, and debating, have a great time in, in, in Holland. And I said, well, this, kind of, this is kind of odd. So I'm very happy to be here today and here to be here today to speak about China, India, in India, as opposed to be in Europe. So it's my, I think, my third or fourth time to be back in the city, and I have to say, every time I come here, um, I just I'm filled with just excitement and joy. I, I really, um, I I I love cities. I mean, I was born in a really beautiful city in China, and when I was 10 years old, my family immigrated to the U.S. to a state called Ohio in the middle of the cornfields, and I had this huge culture shock. I was like, where are the people? Where are the buildings? There's only tra one traffic light. Is this, is this even real? Um, so my whole life, I think, has been, you know, even later studying architecture, has been trying to get back to that urbanity that I think that many developed cities and developed economies have lost, whether they're living in the countryside, in the suburbs, or in the city. Um, so that might contextualize a little bit um, of my fascination was really everyday life in the city and to really look at the reasons behind why people migrate to cities and are attracted to cities such as Mumbai. So, um, so the, the lecture today, I, I, I told Rupelli it's a bit of a tall order to speak about both my work in Shenzhen and Hong Kong in 30 minutes uh, because each has its own um, complexities uh, and to introduce it to an audience that I know a lot of you do know about China and Chinese cities and perhaps some about Hong Kong I'm also aware that many students don't so I'll try to provide both uh, the context in which I work in because I, I would say my work is really about demystifying the, the images that these cities are usually portrayed in so the two cities I will talk about is located uh, following Dilip's uh, presentation, at the mouth of the Pearl River Delta. Uh, and the Pearl River Delta is where 
the, the Pearl River estuary, if, if there was a drawing uh, like that, it basically stretches between China all the way to Vietnam. It's where the Pearl River estuary flows into the South China Sea. And that um, geographic proximity of these two cities and the geographic proximity of these two cities with the sea and with del the delta has very much influenced uh, the much longer history of, of, of the civilization at this part. Um, I know that most people around the world, when they hear about Hong Kong, when they hear about Shenzhen, it is one of a very modern metropolis. But what um, I wanted to remind, I, I'm not going to really focus on the historical aspect of the, the, the region. I do cover it some my, in my book, which I talk about a little bit. But that uh, human occupation of this area in terms of urban settlements, so we're not talking about uh, too early, urban settlements dates back 2,000 years of written history of urban settlements and, uh, and military and commercial and political governance. So it is very much a region full of ecologies and histories and cultures that somehow we have forgotten and we're only looking at very much in the only in the last say decade or in the last 20, 30 years. And, and for me, that's deeply problematic. But there is a reason why that is, because when people talk about the Pearl River Delta, Hong Kong is here, Shenzhen is here, um, Zhuhai is here, uh, Guangzhou is here. The reason why people talk about the Pearl River Delta today is that it is um, hosting approximately 120 million people. The, I'm sorry, it's in euros. Um, I, I think I copied the wrong slide. This was when I was giving a talk, I think, uh, last time in Europe. Uh, 1.2 trillion euros, which is 10% of the total China's national GDP. So, and that GDP really was very quickly amassed uh, in, the, in the past, in the past, 40 decades, uh, four decades. So, and, and that transformation, that economic transformation very much had human and environmental consequences. So this is the, the Pearl River Delta and with all of the cities surrounding it in uh, 1988, this is a satellite image by NASA. So this is it in 2004, so you could see the, the very much the transformation of kind of uh, wetland and estuary and water bodies and land masses into uh, very much right now that the majority of what could be paved by concrete is paved by concrete. Uh, and with that, Shenzhen has been very much a focus of so-called kind of the, the Chinese miracle in, in the past uh, few decades. And there's also a good reason for that. So Shenzhen's population in 1979, and this is really the beginning of Chinese economic reform, was a population of 300,000. Now, if you have ever read anything about Shenzhen, whether it's the New York Times or The Economist, they all say Shenzhen was a small fishing village in the 70s. Um, I don't think a village can have 300,000 people, first of all. Uh, so 300,000 people means there were actually 2,000 villages in the territory that became Shenzhen. And that very much, uh, through my research, impacted the kind of rapid urban growth and economic growth. I'm not doing anything, but maybe you can turn one of this off because the two are having... Sorry? Yeah, yeah, uh, speaking to I just speaking to both. Yeah. Okay. So, and then I have to hide behind the podium, which is fine. Um, so, starting from a population of three hundred thousand and a very small.
Okay. That, that was uh, very exciting. I hope those of you who are asleep are awake now. So you can, you can then listen to me. It's okay? Or should I wait? It's okay. All right. It's not a fire. Okay, good. Even if there is, you can't go anywhere. You got to listen to my talk first. <laughs> I flew all the way here from Hong Kong. <laughs> so, um, so starting from a very small economic production in 1979, in, in 25 years, by 2005, the population has grew from 300,000 to 12 million. And this population growth is quite literally unprecedented in human history that the growth of cities in terms of population and in terms of ec economy was, has been so unexplainable that even people in China everywhere call it the Shenzhen miracle, right? It, that it is, it really plays into this narrative of an instant miraculous city that because of top-down planning and central policy of special economic zones, of market reforms, created this economic miracle. And, and a lot of people in 2005, when I first started working in the city of Shenzhen, there was a lot of discussion that this is it. This is, this is where Shenzhen has reached because Shenzhen has developed all of its land. Um, it's, the cost of living is very high already. If housing is not afford, affordable, it's gonna go downhill. Well, from the next decade, from 2005 to 2015, the population continued to grow into 20 million people. The GDP tripled, and now Shenzhen is tutored around the world as the, the, the future city, as China's next future city. It, you might have heard the, the accolade uh, some Western media have given to Shenzhen calling the Silicon Valley of China. I, you know, my parents live in San Francisco Bay. I know the Silicon Valley. It, it, there's all sorts of problems with that, with that metaphor, but let's just kind of understand that this is what people are fascinated with. People are fascinated with this image of this modern city of you know, tall skyscrapers, wide boulevards, it's very picturesque, it's very clean. And when I first went to Shenzhen in 2005, I just wanted to leave. I was flying there from, Shenzhen, from Beijing, which is where I was working at the time, I went to Shenzhen, and I went there to curate the first Shenzhen Biennale, and I just, didn't really find the city very interesting until one day I got lost and I walked into a neighborhood that was like this. I was like, oh, this is so strange. What, what is this about? So that was really what started my own, uh, my own professional and personal relationship with this interesting city. And the reason why I have found it so interesting for the past two decades is because everyone is fascinated with this with the city as this, um, the city as planned, the city as high rises, the city as this very pristine picture of cap capitalistic endeavors. But to me, I have found the city is also this, it's full of these pockets of urban, urban settlements that eventually uh, I came to know quite a lot and start to research about it and they're called urban villages, um, which are, do very, com complex set of issues um, very similar to the informal settlements around the world in that they're built by former villagers. None of the buildings have been through uh, codes or building departments, so they're very much illegal. Yet they house, um, so I said that Shenzhen today has about 20 million people, right? So the, ur the urban villages of Shenzhen collectively hold about 10 million people. So that means that one out of two working in the city, this so-called future city, live in housing built by agrarian villagers uh, just in the past decades. So, you know, on issues of representation, when we look at satellite images of Shenzhen, this is urban center Shenzhen this way, it looks very green, it has these big boulevards, this is a huge luxury golf course there. But if we zoom in a bit, more, you see that there's a very much a differentiation in that urban fabric. So this is a, a large theme park. It's one of the most popular, earliest popular theme parks of China called Windows to the World. This is the Shenzhen uh, Boulevard, Shenan Boulevard that connects throughout the city. And this is a uh, urban village. So you can tell that the scale of the buildings between the urban village and outside are completely different. 
right? So in a similar way, say if we took a satellite image, you know, above Darby, you will also have similar differentiations in the texture and scale of the buildings. And I want you to pay a little bit attention to this little square. So that is, um, that little square is where kind of some of the older collective housing at this village was. And then these, because these buildings were collectively owned by the villagers, they, they no single person could demolish them. So you see all of these houses, the kind of houses, I call them houses. I mean, I know they look like little mini skyscrapers because they were, they used to be the, the plot of land for each individual villager. So they used to be one story, two story village houses that houses the villager themselves. But when you had this massive rapid immigration of migrants from all over uh, China, it was the villagers who started to kind of build these uh, self-built housing that start to provide affordable accommodation to the migrant workers, regardless of whether the migrant worker was a 12-year-old uh, villager that really has never been to school, or later a PhD graduate from Tsinghua um, who has three degrees and needs to come to the city and, and find work. Um, this is where they came. So the urban villages became the site of point arrival for, for many, for I would say the majority of the migrants coming into Shenzhen. And when I say the majority of the migrants coming into Shenzhen, keep in mind the city in 1979 is 300,000. It's a city of 20 million. So that means from the mayor all the way down to the street cleaner, they're all migrants. We are all migrants. And yet, in 2005, when I first went to Shenzhen, the, the city launched a campaign uh, with the goal to eradicate all cancers of the city. They were referring to the urban villages. So here in Mumbai, I'm sure you're familiar with certain that type of rhetoric of referring to the informal settlements as embarrassments, as mistakes, and as cancers of society. And yet, if we look at this is a density mapping of the center of Shenzhen, if you kind of squint your eyes a little bit to see where the highest densities are, all the red circles, those are the locations of all the urban villages. And they're really remarkable, and again, similar to what you might find Darby, uh, in, in Mumbai, they're really located in the most convenient locations in the middle of the city. The reason is because the city landed on top of the villages. This is not a condition in which it's villages surrounding the city in the traditional sense of how the European city might have grown. This is really a hybrid of both the countryside and uh, the, kind of the urbanness of cities all together. And so in this way, so we cannot separate between the urban and the rural because they're the same entity, in fact. So, I started, uh, this is a, a decade ago, I started working with um, the city government and when they created, uh, you know, at train as an architect and, and also being interested in urban planning and, and looking at the issues of urban design, I started to engage with this issue of Shenzhen, urban villages, and what I saw was a bit problematic um, treatment or perspectives of the city. And so, so through various formats, this was an a, a international urban planning competition on what to do with one very centrally located in urban village. Um, I won the competition uh, by providing them with a way to say that the city and the villages can coexist and they must coexist. And, and while it's the villagers themselves who want to demolish um, all of the village housing and develop skyscrapers, um, our proposal gave them an idea of a phased plan where you only demolish and build as is needed. So rather than a master plan that basically uh, say that the most completeness is com to demolish everything. So it's this idea of staged planning. So each stage is a complete plan that can still work. It doesn't call for total demolition. So that is from planning and at architecture this was uh, a few years ago, turning abandoned Hakka village housing that this used to house a family, if, like, 10 families of this one particular urban village, and it's been abandoned for 20 years. No one wants to live in there. So we turned it into a community center and an exhibition center, still keeping some of the relics from kind of this communal living. 
Um, and then to start hosting exhibitions and trainings and workshops for the villagers, the artists who's the, who has really started to occupy this village, but also the migrant workers who live and work in factories around this particular. So that is kind of the scale of the architecture. I also curated a number of exhibitions. This is one that's called uh, 10 Million Units, Housing in an Affordable City. This idea to really think about these this issue of housing is really not about affordable housing. The issue of housing is really how housing can make the city affordable. So to start really not really understanding architecture and housing as a separate entity, but really understand that it is all integral components, the live, the work, the transport, social amenities, everything is really part of that one, one ecology, so to speak. Um, so bringing people together and examining different issues from kind of one-to-one -one scales of how housing could be built to kind of new um, high density housing that could be inserted. Um, so through working on all of this, I, I've constantly have come up with this one dilemma, which is having to change the mentality of people to no longer see the urban villages as something negative that had to be give, get, to had to be get rid of and what i found was that even when i was able to win the competitions i was able to convince the mayors of the city the planners of the city and start working with planners to, to really create these these um projects and planning whether it's architecture or, or a master plan it was the people who live in the urban villages also that wanted to get rid of them so fundamentally, what I realized that as an architect, I can work with a group of people, but I can't change the society by one building. So there was, became this really um, idiotic goal is that I wanted to somehow write about the, the city of Shenzhen and, and start to really have an impact beyond the reach of architecture and urbanism, architecture and urban planning. So this is a project, uh, this is a book, I would say 15 years in the making. It was, I'm sharing with you today because it was just published three weeks ago. Uh, it's published by Harvard University Press. I'm sorry, I don't have a copy because I don't have it yet. Uh, it's, it's on Amazon, apparently. Um, so it is on Amazon if one people want to take a look at it. I want to tell you that I negotiated very hard with Harvard Press to keep the cost of the book as cheap as possible. And in fact, I switched from another press to, to Harvard Press in order to do that. So I hope that you will find the, 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 the price of the book accessible uh, everywhere in Asia, including India. So part of, the, part of the reason why it had to be book is that I started to really uncover the history of the region. I spoke to it earlier, is that this, this mythic origin of a brand new modern city just on, the, on, a, on a blank slate really was at, at the root of some of the, the problems, is that if we can think that this successful city was instantly created, we can also instantly erase and create new ones. And there wasn't this understanding that actually what has happened in the past 40 years had absolutely foundations to the history in which the region has evolved over the past centuries. So a lot of the book tried to address that, but also in covering kind of the other story or the hidden story, I also had to confront kind of the, the, the predominant narrative of Deng Xiaoping and the Chinese economic reform and try, try to situate kind of my perspective on the city and dissect this kind of much longer and nuanced history city and how it intersected with the mismaking of this instant city um, and how the architectures of the city was really born out not only of say drawings and uh, spatial pursuits, but it really came out of pursuit of people who wanted to come to the city and to make a new life and to make a new economy and to make new opportunities. Um, that every single building, this is, I, I said that 10 million people lives in these urban village buildings that started from a house to a little taller house to now, um, you know, eight stories tall, that, that gross, has uh, a human face behind it. So this is a couple villagers who own this particular building. If you have, if you just Google the nail house of Shenzhen, you, you probably will find some news about it. Um, so this couple was the one that was holding out against developer uh, demolition of 
their whole village. Um, and so in, in crafting the book, I realized actually the most powerful way to communicate this nuanced history of the city to a broader audience is really through people. So every chapter of the book started to be framed around the personal histories of individuals whose lives were impacted by the city, but also whose lives impacted the city itself. So the, the kind of personal narratives in each chapter, the personal narratives of individuals in the city is mixed with kind of environmental history, the landscape history, the architectural history, and the economic history um, and such. So ultimately, in, in the end of uh, trying to explain how Shenzhen was able to grow so quickly, you know, I came as an architect came to the real <laughs> came to realization that many many people of course know it is really about the people. It's the people like these villagers whose families have lived into on this land for centuries, and how they have then through opportunities, not out of kindness, but out of social and economic opportunities, also created buildings and spaces and social forms that could accommodate the newcomers, the migrants. And it is a history about how, really the history of migration, how families and communities start to evolve and, and grow very rapidly and, and develop into an economy uh, that is Shenzhen. So in this way, the kind of, there is this perceived image of the, of, I would say not only Shenzhen, but perhaps the Chinese city globally. And that image is, is one of centralized governance, is one of top-down master planning, is one of a controlled economy, a rural urban divide. I'm sure you hear this a lot when people talk about China. Cultural disruptions um, and exclusive communities. You, you do read and see a lot about kind of gated communities. While all of these perhaps is true and does exist, this also exists. And I call this the inconvenient history because it, it is much more nuanced, it's much more complex, and it is much counter to the central narrative of master planning and centralized policy. And that is one of collaborative governance. Every single urban village has a village collective. They vote on policies. They, they really negotiate with the city on what happens to their village. It's one on flexible planning. A Shenzhen urban planner would tell you, him or herself, that you cannot plan the city. You can make certain plannings and hope something might happen, but you must change that plan constantly because the city itself changes your plan. Um, it is one of the informal economy. Um, the, the first 10 years of Shenzhen's economic growth, the majority of the GDP came from small village enterprises. It was not big companies. It was not Coca-Cola or Microsoft. It was small village enterprises and collaborations between Shenzhen residents and also Hong Kong investors. But those Hong Kong investors did not go to Shenzhen via formal channels. They went to Shenzhen because they were all relatives and they had common friends, a common ancestry, and many cases, uh, common last names because they used to come from the same village centuries of these old villages. Uh, one of urban rural continuum, um, when I said the city and the urban villages really developed together, you cannot separate what is urban and what is a rural in Shenzhen. Um, cultural continuity, and the, what I found is that what's really interesting about looking at the urban villages and the city through the lens of history, and one started to understand that these sites of the urban villages really are the points of cu cultural and historical continuity that we can trace back through centuries of history all the way to today, and to, I'm certain to forward another 50 or even 500 years. Uh, and one of inclusive communities. Um, you cannot have a successful city of 20 million migrants if we don't talk about and didn't, that it didn't have inclusive communities. It, 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 that in itself it could not have happened. And if we look at the lessons of Shenzhen, it teaches us inclusive communities is by far more sustainable and more uh, wealth making for everyone. So this is a drawing, this is a map. It's one of the first kind of uh, cartography of this is, this is Shenzhen and this is Hong Kong's territory. I won't go th through the political history behind this, but this was uh, done in the 1800s. 
And what, basically what you can see, all of these little dots were sites of villages, important villages that, that, that had settlements and, and townships. And what you can also see is that the, it was very much a continuum, the land mass and the villages, you know, the border that later became to be dividing between Shenzhen and Hong Kong in very much was artificial. And they divided families, it divided the land, it divided river, the rivers. Um, so I would use this map to pivot into, um, Ripelli asked me to speak about some about my Hong my work in Hong Kong in the past few years, I really had concentrated the intensity of my work was with uh, urban village communities in Shenzhen for the first decade I was in Hong Kong. And in the last five years, I've been turning more of my attention to the communities in Hong Kong. And there is a strand of, there is a relationship between the, the work I've done in the two cities. I hope you'll be able to see that soon. So, um, this is a Hong Kong eviction, uh, eviction risk mapping that I did with my students. And basically we have mapped kind of where the locations of all the older buildings are. So with Hong Kong's rapid pace of urban development, the older buildings are the ones that is going to be demolished very, very quickly. And who lives in the older buildings are the migrants, uh, are the kind of working class people, are those who really are living in poverty. And I know that uh, perhaps because of what has happened in Hong Kong over the past six months, the world has come to see Hong, uh, Hong Kong in a different way. Uh, it, it used to be when I talk about poverty in Hong Kong, uh, people are just shocked. Um, but the fact is one in five people in Hong Kong live in poverty. And if you want to know why the, 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 there are people in the street, have been people in the streets um, in the past six years, um, this is one of the reasons is that there is a discontent with the way in which this apparently very wealthy city um, still have in many ways neglected its most needy population. To the, in the way that you have um, hundreds of thousands of people who live in these very, very small homes that you, know, you have a family of say five, three generations all living in five square meters. This is the reality of Hong Kong. Um, and unlike the, say, the, the slums or informal settlements in other countries, you might recognize, uh, where it's visible, the divide between uh, right, what's left and, and right is visible, here is also visible. The, the informal housing situation in Hong Kong is invisible because it's really found in the interiors, this kind of extreme urban density, both in terms of spatial density and population density, are well hidden behind the facade of the buildings. So we started um, a project, uh, this is four years ago, we started a project called Project Home Improvement, and, and re recalling some of the thesis that students presented yesterday of home and housing, um, where we started to really understand, you know, from kind of an urbanistic point of view, where these buildings are located, and most important, how do people live in there? Um, and we had to discover new ways of drawing, new ways of representation, where it's no longer enough to draw the buildings or even the plan or section. It was important to draw every single object, all of the worldly possessions of the family who live in there. So by this, then you start to understand both the density at which people live in here, but also the life that people have in here. So I point out, you know, here's a guitar. So you start to see the density. This is a family of five. Uh, this is eight square meters total. And the family of five only have one bed and one small couch. So they, they bed share. So it's impossible to imagine that in a wealthy economy, one of the most wealthy cities in the world, people, working class people, people who work, this is um, actually had to bed share, to rest. We also looked at the environmental consequences of this extreme high density into these age buildings. And we started to build uh, models to try to communicate with the people who live in there, um, and along with the, the, the help and partnership with local NGOs and social workers, we were able to start um, going into the homes and start meeting with the families and start to talk about how can we, through 
architectural knowledge through small scale interventions, can we do something to alleviate some of the pressures and some of the challenges of this extreme high density dwelling? And I would have to say that it's, it was extremely difficult to try to create this as an architectural project because as architects, we make space with objects, whether at whatever scale, but here we don't have space and it's full of objects. So, the, so it became this incredibly challenging uh, process of working with my students, working in the local community and working with um, the families where we also had to resort to certain technologies. This is um, a resident looking at a VR uh, clip of us showing him that if he could allow us to help him to rearrange his home that is in a very small area and then allow us to, to design and build different types of uh, furniture that, allow, that allows to mediate light, that can be stores, that can provide a study desk for his daughter who's always hunched on her bunk bed, that perhaps we can try to alleviate that. And because the, the reason why we started using this is that the models, the kids all loved it, but even making these models, many of the families couldn't imagine what that would be like. So we decided to use this, uh, you know, say later technology that is usually used for the other 1% for this, this particular audience. Um, we also started to use technology. To, so everything we started to provide for these families because we are not master craftsmen. We have very small, limited budget. So all of the, all of the pieces we have built over the past years were all uh, cut by CNC machines. And that was for... Different, uh, dif different reasons. One is um, the machine can cut much more precisely than architecture students. Sorry. <laughs> um, second is that we can invent these very precise joints that allow these pieces to be able to be assembled and disassembled very quickly because these are very small cramped quarters. And the reason why they don't have adequate architecture in their rooms is because there's no space for it and because existing furniture are too big or too clunky or in some cases not high enough in quality for them. So being able to use the later the, the latest technology, whether it's digital fabrication or visualization, allow us to be able to think, can we use more advanced technologies for the communities that usually doesn't get the benefit of them? Um, so the end result are pieces like this where we assemble everything in the university to make sure we can assemble them in a limited space where you can't not even reach your hand behind. So we had to invent new joints and new ways of assembling together. We also want to make sure it's beautiful. And, and that was something that I spoke to my student constantly is that we as architects need to also believe in the, the power of beauty is that when you make something beautiful with care, the people who use it will also feel it. And that's the difference between us and Ikea. When many people ask us, well, this is what Ikea is doing. Well, ours is made with love, by hand. <laughs> and that's really important because then we show the, when we move the pieces in, we show the residents how to put this together because the groups of the people who live in the subdivided units of Hong Kong are the ones at most risk of evictions due to urban renewal, due to increasing rent. So we wanted to make sure each piece is also adaptable to different possible homes. Um, so each piece, then the installation process also had to be very quick because all of the residents, they hold three jobs, they had to pick up the kids, so we, all of this was a massive task of design, but it was designed with time, with resources, with economy, with society, and with individuals that I had to say, you know, I've been an architect for 30 years, I would say, at this series of, I would say, architectural intervention has been the most challenging for me uh, because of the extreme limitations and also the extreme density and the extreme economy in which we had to work. So this is some of the before after. So this, um, this was uh, the VR render I was showing before where everything was stacked next to the window to the point that the family always keep the window closed. So you then build up the humidity and the, the, the temperature. So we try to convince them for us to replace all of this with something like this. So it can still allow 
the, the window to be accessible for storage and a place for study. Um, this was another before and after, and the scale was very small. This was simply replacing, um, it was towels they used over the windows, replacing it with a window screen that had four layers. It had a layer for to prevent rats from coming into the window because this family had a newborn baby. It had another layer to prevent mosquitoes because in high humidity, high density, it is the most rapid spread of disease. Uh, it had a third layer of, you know, a structural system that allows us to attach to the existing frame. And they had a fourth layer of this fabric that was developed uh, by Quadra, which is kind of the world leading textile uh, designers. And this textile from Quadra was designed for high end museums that can that had a, a metallic thin metallic weave into the fabric so it can block uv heat and still natural allow natural light in so we partnered uh, with quadra i said like, can you please donate us some fabric let us experiment so we use this like very expensive fabric designed for the world's most expensive architecture in these homes because actually they needed this much more than those 24 hour air conditioned monitor museums. So for the sake of time, I'm just gonna run through the next few slides because I still wanna save time to be able to have a conversation with Rupelli. Um, I added this because of yesterday's uh, the students project on um, dealing with the homeless. So I wanted to share um, with you something we have been doing, not as an answer, but to show you that, you know, there are, you're not alone in trying to think what can we do uh, and what other possibilities could be there. Um, so it was through working with families and, and into these types of buildings, we started to discover actually there is extreme rate of vacancy of the buildings in Hong Kong, despite the fact there's housing shortage, because many of those buildings, they've been bought up by developers and they're just kept empty. I don't know if you have that here in India. Um, so the orange and red are every year new housing supplies. The green is vacant building units. So we started to think, and this is another chart of showing the homeless population of Hong Kong. So we started to think, rather than the homeless uh, sleeping here or in these shelters that has no privacy where they have to leave at nine in the morning and not return to six, 365 days a year, have no reprieve and no privacy and no social space. Could we start to look at and take advantage of these temporarily vacant buildings and start to convert them? So we partnered up with a developer who is willing to rent to this NGO, four units for one Hong Kong dollars for two years. And we started to understand how the structures are and, and we created uh, this project turning what we call the Friendship Homes. So it's a cohabitation um, situation where six homeless individuals um, can have a collectively shared space, but also their own individual sleeping space. And what was remarkable about this process is that we just ran out of money in the end before this thing was uh, to be assembled. But because we learned from certain process of working with the home improvement projects, of making them prefabricated, al allowing it to be easy to be constructed, we actually engaged social workers, volunteers, and the homeless population residents who want to stay here, and our, uh, my own researchers and my own team in the university, we assembled them together to save on the construction costs of hiring builders and contractors. And in that process, it was quite amazing that actually four people uh, who, came, who, who volunteered, who were homeless themselves, later became residents in, in, this, in the completed version. So it's turning these vacant, uh, units that would have been vacant from a period of anywhere from two years to 15 years uh, into at least livable places for the for the residents. So this is their small um, private space with uh, sleeping, storage, study desks. Um, and also what was most important is we wanted to make sure there was enough space and facilities for communal uh, interactions. And so today, the, the people who live in there, they cook for each other, 
they um, do each other's laundries, and they, they really have formed the small community. And what also was remarkable is that these, these two individuals, when the last time I went to visit them, they were happy to tell me that they soon wouldn't have to live here anymore. Because before, when they lived in the homeless shelters, when they applied for job applications, they had to put the homeless shelter address or no address. So they had a hard time looking for jobs. Now they had a real address and they were able to get proper jobs and they were able to get proper uh, money. So with the savings, after a period of six months or a year, they don't have to live in here anymore. So it's this idea of design with time, right? The time of the architecture, the time of the city, but also time of the, of the residents. So I, I, I did position the talk as a tale of two cities, a tale of Shenzhen and Hong Kong, but ultimately it's the tale of two cities um, that as architects and planners, we're asked to make this and work with that. Um, but there is also the other side of the city that I think as architects uh, and I, from the presentations I saw from the students who were graduating, I really do also see uh, that desire and, and that intention to also work with this city. Um, it will be a difficult path, I have to say, <laughs> using my own self, because no one's going to hand you projects like that. You're, you're never going to be hired. Can you go design a homeless shelter that is in a vacant building where you can try to convince the developer to rent it to you? There is, it won't exist, but you just have to keep going. You just have to keep understanding, keep learning, gathering knowledge, gathering strength, gathering techniques and ideas, and to be able to find a place in our cities that socially minded architects could still have a position and could still try to say, we, we can make a difference. So thank you. Okay, I what we just see in the form and going to this uh, for the sake of time, uh, we will stop at 1.15, 1.20, and we we'll wait for lunch, and we will have the next panel after lunch. Um, so I just, um, I think the conversation, and thank you, John, too, for the, for the presentation. Um, and I think one of the things that we've been thinking of is that uh, there are certain languages that we have developed to talk about cities through. Um, and a lot of these, these kind of languages uh, come from ideas of tent cities, uh, the idea of lack of housing, um, uh, the, the idea of, uh, you know, I mean, I think we use the word poverty um, also, and in some ways, um, the, the, and, and not to say that there are hardships and not to say that, you know, all of this doesn't exist, but that the kind of language that we develop in some ways leads to a certain kind of housing that we see here, right? It, you know, whether it is this kind of housing that we, we see in the market or even the public housing that, you know, that, that sort of gets produced. Uh, and as opposed to that, you, you see the, the experience of the urban village um, or even the kind of the Hong Kong housing, in spite of the fact that it's so narrow, you know, you start drawing on those objects around. And there is a kind of form of social life Right, that that uh, this housing in some ways uh, it, you know, emanates. So my question is then: Is there something wrong uh, in the way we sort of think of languages of, of talking about cities, too, uh, which gives rise to the certain this kind of housing that you know this other city that you said also is very boring, and, you know, that you didn't like. So I think it would be interesting to sort of reflect on this. What are the frameworks or what are the languages through which we think of cities through? Um, and I think, I, again, I would like to congratulate you for the book, um, you know, Your Shenzhen Experiment, though we haven't seen it yet and we haven't read it. And because that's, I think, a conversation that we were having uh, over dinner as well, that in some ways, um, the idea that the, the global south in some ways becomes a field. You know, and, and the theories somehow come from somewhere else, they come from the West. How do we actually start thinking of cities in the global south from, uh, from new languages, you know, from new languages of talking about cities too? So I think it's this, this kind of question that I, I'm sort of thinking through. Um, and perhaps we can sort of talk about that and then I'll sort of reflect on some of the things that we've been sort of also engaged in. 
um, on, on language. I, I perhaps I, I have a little bit different take uh, on the issue of language. It, and it really came out of um, this challenge that I very naively accepted in working on this book. Um, is, you know, Harvard Press said five years ago, we're really interested in the book. Um, however, we would like for you to rewrite it so that it could be written in a language that could be accessible to a general intellectual audience rather than only to academics, architects, and planners. I said, sure, no problem. I didn't realize when I said that how difficult it would be uh, where it was trying to explain some of these very complex processes and history and politics and economy and forms using everyday language. So for me, I became less interested about finding and creating and theorizing. I'm more interested in really creating simple narratives that is about kind of a human story of architecture and human story of, of, of buildings and human story of cities. So for me, I, the in some ways, language and words are really important because they change how we think and they change how we look at things. Um, but one, you know, my personal effort has been how can I write and speak about these extreme complexities using words that anyone can understand, that anyone can feel, and anyone can identify with? So, again, this is partly because of where um, the process that I've gone through, but also the communities I've been working with. Um, you know, I, I was trained in my graduate studies at, at Princeton where a conversation cannot be had without a sentence that's, you know, five minutes long. And I really, I understand that. I, you know, when, when I do go back to the U.S. and go on these reviews, I can do these long run on sentences better than anyone, I think. But I've tried to also, I think in the past 20, 30 years, go away from that and to say, let's just use the most simple words that anyone can understand and anyone can feel. And in, in some ways, that's why the book took so long because I literally had to change the vocabularies in which I was using to describe. So even though, for example, I've been using this theoretical framework of urban informality as a foil to describe the urban villages as a way to link it to a global conversation of the plan versus on plan, I really didn't use that in the book. You know, a hundred thousand word book, I didn't use the very concept that I've been thinking about for 15 years because I wanted to see, can I describe about this in a way that doesn't put people off, who doesn't have that academic training and who doesn't have that theoretical background? Uh, because ultimately, and I explained part of the reason why I wanted to write this book, is that I think some of the biggest challenges we have as architects to try to make our cities more equitable and more social are not, is not, developers are not politicians, but really in the mentalities that people have. And in order for us to change the mentalities, everyday people, including the people we're trying to help with, we have to be able to discuss and communicate these very complex issues in the most simple terms possible. So I know it's not straight answering what you were saying, um, but that's kind of how I've been, uh, the position which I have developed, I, I think, over the past number of years. I just, I just wanted to connect uh, this question of language also to the previous presentation, uh, which in some ways started um, talking about the line. Um, and, and in some ways, I think you were not there um, when we walked in. But we were also thinking of the fact that cities themselves also have blurred lines, you know, and I, I think that's something that I see in the urban villages as well. Uh, and we, use, we often use these two terms which are very useful for us to uh, think of cities through. Uh, one is, uh, we use the term transactional capacities. 
Um, and when you see a kind of plan, a plan of a city, uh, generally you see a single line, right? That's the line of the GIS or, you know, the line that, that sort of talks about the, the, a single ownership. Um, and more and more we are sort of relying on these new technologies to start governing cities through. But that line, if you really look at the inhabited city or the city that is sort of lived, is not a single line, but it's a blurred line, it's a corroded line. And that's what you see in the urban village, right? It's the, the corroded line as opposed to the hard edge line of the rest of the scheduled city, right? And I, I think that's where your, the transactional capacities, and that's a useful term because it sort of opens up transactions in terms of all, it's hard money because you can also transact, you can, you have your businesses located within, you know, where the, the home and the living happens together, but also transactions in terms of securities, in terms of kinship relationships, yeah, that get built in the urban villages. Um, and I think that is a useful sort of uh, term to start even um, talking to, you know, I mean, not only villagers, but also, um, you know, I mean, I'm also thinking that you can actually use those terms to talk at various levels, but, you know, you sort of, that's where the language comes in. Um, and the second term uh, that we often find very useful is the term setting. Yeah, that cities setting very slowly. Yeah, so in fact, that city that we see the two, uh, the diptych that you see, the city on the top is really not a city; it's a project. Yeah, and so that the fact that cities grow and they, they grow slowly, build relationships and slowly consolidate, and that's something that you start seeing in both cases. So I think to sort of bring in in, in, a, in a kind of discussion. Uh, about cities, I think we need to move our, our sort of um, the languages of talking about cities to the realm of experiences. And I, I think that's what I see in some of your, uh, even your interventions, that it's about, you know, you said it's beautiful, right? So what is this, what is the idea of talking about cities through the realm of experience? Um, and that's when you start sort of shifting the registers of starting to say that, you know, it's, you provide that house which is uh, you know, the, the kind of techno-legal language that we use to talk about cities through, you say you're, you're providing a house which is a, which is um, in some ways a replacement of the older house, but it's, it's a 20 square meter house, right? So it's a number. But if you sort of shift the registers to experience, then you start thinking of the, the social form of the house, the relationships, what are you actually building? And I see that, that sort of possibility in, in starting to think of what happens even in terms of the intervention. Because if you don't think of it through experience, then you will say, okay, the homeless person doesn't have a house, or that uh, the Hong Kong unit is really, really tiny. And so what do you do? You know, and the, the, kind of the, the opposite of that would be a certain kind of public housing. And in, I mean, if I just kind of give you the example of, uh, of Mumbai, it's the it's, it's slum which moves into the SRA, right? The SRA house, which is, 25 square meter house, but it's actually worse than the slum. It has no transactional capacities. It has no forms of experience. So I just feel like that's an important sort of relationship to start thinking of. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, absolutely. The, so the two terms, lines and experiences, you know, especially in today, 2020, um, the, the boundaries between many things I think we have taken for granted over the past, say, century no longer exist, right? There is no boundary between nature and city. There is no boundary between man-made and natural. I mean, you, there's no more pristine nature in the world that is not intervened, had, had not been intervened by, by man. So there's no lines between city and village. Um, country to side and cities. I mean, so even in Shenzhen, no one can draw a line between the urban village and the non-urban village because the two have totally integrated into one. And that's only of, of say, architectural form or property ownership. But if you talk about experiences, that's even more, right? Um, the reason why the urban villages have so many shops is that they're not only serving the people who live and work in the urban villages. They're also serving the people who live in the gated communities around it who want to come here to be able to have cheaper food or, you know, things that they can get from all, that's collected from all, all over China. And that is not just the Walmart that's below their high rise. 
So this, no, this, this uh, notion about understanding our cities and our buildings and our interventions through experiences is absolutely something that I would agree with and, and would advocate and thank you to be able to see that in the work is really to understand that after all, you know, whether cities or buildings, um, it, it has a life when someone uses it and it has a longer life when someone loves it, right? So to be able for me to have looked at kind of this history of this particular city, Shenzhen, that everyone keeps saying is 40 years, to have charted a you know, 2000 year old history of the territory, um, it actually allowed me to really think about longer term in the future, like, if we try to make decisions today that doesn't, that is not only in terms of what's going to happen in the next five years or 10 years, but if we start making choices to say what's going to happen in the next 500 years, how would people 500 years from now judge what we are doing today and what we have done and what decisions we make? You know, I, I think in some ways to be able to go beyond the way in which we've been thinking about buildings and the way we've been thinking about architecture and really to think of it in a breadth of time uh, and also in the complexity of the kind of the lived experiences um, is, is absolutely important and it challenges many of the tools. I mean, it, it challenges many of the tools uh, that architects and planners have come to be very comfortable in, in using, you know, uh, you know, the master plan. What, what is the master plan? Or even the building plan. What is the building plan? You know, um, we have in this very wealthy, advanced, technologically advanced city in China, Shenzhen. I mean, I only share with you today, say, the, the urban village aspect, but, the, you know, I said... 15 years ago, I found the formal city not interesting. It was my naivete, I think, on my part to think just because it looks the same, it must be the same. But that's not true. If you look at the experiences of the formal city of, of Shenzhen, it also you know, has a very incredible set of uniquenesses um, that has did push the boundaries of economy and technology. And it has led China in almost every single possible way in the past few decades. And what I've realized is that, um, that it was my own bias to think that there is the Shenzhen proper, formal, planned, and there's the urban villages informal, unplanned, because the, the so the plan, the, the formal aspects we talk about the city is absolutely influenced by the way these kind of informal economies and in, in, in any form of actions, and the informal economies and informal actions were you know, empowered and, you know, pushed and evolved and benefited from the formal development. So in these ways, um, you know, we, we spoke a little bit earlier is that I think it's important to talk about binaries because it allow us to be able to highlight the conflicts and contest and protests between elements, but it's also important to look beyond the binaries um, to say that actually, the the two is really two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. I just want you to just bring in one other point and then I open it to the audience. Um, you know, my understanding in your work that I sort of see is this idea of improvement. Um, and again, that's that's something that often, you know, the whole legacy of modern architecture sort of completely erased. You always had to start from scratch, right? Like it was city I like the ideal, you start you, there's a tabula rasa situation with Prima, and then you start afresh. Um, but in some ways, I mean that that's some one of the statistics that we've been taking off even in place of housing. We've had policies, you know, for the last twenty years we've had housing policies in in uh, Mumbai, uh, which sort of talk about uh, you know, whether it's the slum housing or it's old lab housing, the, the, there's a huge gap between the supply and the demand in spite of having progressive policies in place. Uh, but the fact that is that people have houses, it's not the, the number of homeless is much smaller. Um, so how is it possible to start thinking of not building a new, but improving? 
yeah, so this idea of repair and retrofit is something that perhaps is possible to think about to sort of to, to bridge that gap, that huge gap that we are, you know, we have been faced with. And in that sense, I think this whole, I mean, we really need to change the paradigms of the way we think of architecture. Can I improve when we see as architecture? You know, often, um, I know when we are, I was in the Women in Design Conference and they were saying, you know, it's the men who build and it's the women who renovate. You know, so I think the kind of the, the whole uh, paradigm of thinking of what you can consider architecture or not, I think needs to change. And, and the, the whole paraphernalia around the, the ecology of the way one builds, I think needs to change as well. So I think maybe, I don't know if you can want to talk about that. Yeah. Um, yes, so that, that has been a pretty consistent dilemma. Uh, you know, when you're trained as an architect, you have this constant urge to create something beautiful and new and grand. Um, and then to be able to challenge, channel that type of energy, you know, really the desire to make, right? you know, even if we don't term it into whether it's the male or the female intentions, I, I, I think I, in a, if I didn't have to, <laughs> if in an ideal world, I could just go ahead and, and design skyscrapers and not worry about this. Um, but I'm built as a human being in that I want to do something when I feel like I could channel my energy somewhere. I don't know if that makes sense. Meaning in an ideal world, if I didn't have to worry about whether it's a homeless or people living in subdivided units or urban villages, I would be very happy building airports and, and bridges and designing new cities. But we don't live in a perfect world and we don't live in an ideal world. And I care about people. So then I had to kind of struggle with this idea is that could we make, could we make beautiful speculations productively through an architecture that is at a different scale. So, you know, I mentioned that, so we've been working in the past four or five years on these very micro architectures, I would say, nano <laughs> our architects. They are really small, but the impact, I think, could be very large. So Hong Kong's, there is a huge public uh, housing debate in Hong Kong today where the protests in the past six months has really made the government scramble to find new land to build new public housing. And it's like billions of dollars recommendation, it's converting um, natural parks that was reserved for nature into buildable land to build these housing. It's huge amount of ecological and uh, economic cost. And we're talking about only providing maybe 10,000 units a day, a, a year, 10,000 units a year. And it's taking the, you know, the legal bodies, the housing authority, the entire kind of year to be able to come up with this 10,000 units a year. The sub subdivided units, the government's estimation is that is around 300,000 people live in 300,000 uh, subdivided units. This is the, the families in need to be housed by that 10,000 units a year. We can never build new housing fast enough to be able to do this. So, so something that I've been working on uh, this year is try to create a program in which we can try to establish a certain protocols to allow community workers, NGOs, students, architects to participate in this program. We renovated you know, 30 units over three years, but that's because I have a small team and very limited budget. But if we can capitalize every single person in this room, if every single person can contribute to re renovating 30 units in three years, that money, the, the, the economic cost of that, it may be 1% of building 10,000 units on very ecologically fragile land, whether it's through reclamation or, or deforestation. So this idea of retrofitting, this idea of renovating, this idea of improving upon the existing rather than just ignoring the existing and building new, I think is very necessary and very crucial, both for an architectural agenda, but also for that social agenda. <laughs> okay, I have three minutes, so 
got into questions? Let's continue the uh, the last point. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, the the is a very very powerful. The city is almost imploding. When the architecture is imploding, when the density implodes, what is the architecture? That's kind of uh, relevant. Earlier in the presentation, you mentioned the term self built You know, uh, to refer to Shenyan villages. And self built is not really self built with plenty of other agencies which are So I was thinking, the, 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 the institutional ecosystem, the, the institutional ecosystem which will be, which will be kind of, which, which, or, or, or the ecosystem which will be kind of, you know, required to, uh, uh, to, to uh, build that architecture of inclusion. What is that? What, what would it be? I mean, one is your mother, you know, taking schools and, uh, but, 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 then, but then if they are building 10,000, you can build 100. You know, so, so that's, a, that's a limitation of that. But what is, what is probably the uh, uh, issue? So, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's, a, I think it's it probably we need to think together to kind of, you know, figure this out. But uh, uh, otherwise, I don't know. Uh, I don't see uh, the systems being uh, based on anything of work that I'm uh, working on. Yeah. Uh, yes. So the the scaling up. So I would say that that is a question I've been thinking about for a long time. So specifically for the subdivided units, so I say that we're trying to create a program that can allow more people to be involved in to escalate the work. So rather than doing 30 a year, we do 3,000 a year. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we have examined the, the policy in which that regulates how people can divide their homes into subdivided units to be able to, to legalize this. So in Hong Kong today, it's not illegal. So if you're a landlord or developer, it's not illegal to subdivide. Um, the reason why they're so small, maybe I need to explain. The reason why they're so small is that people, uh, landlords, are, are taking existing pretty already small Hong Kong apartments and subdivide them into two, three, sometimes ten units. That's why they're so small. And this in itself is not illegal because there are certain guidelines in the building codes, in the building works department that allows this. However, the way that these regulations has been written is very inaccessible. It only talk about issues of size and egress. There's nothing about quality. There's nothing about natural ventilation. There's nothing about natural light. There's nothing about facilities. There's nothing about, say, shared spaces and, 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 and infrastructure. So in these ways, I would say the process in which that we have led these home improvement projects, they are a community and architectural intervention project, but for me, it's also a research process to understand exactly how people live in here, to understand what are the challenges they're facing, so that we can, um, through further study, come up with a set of policy recommendations for the Hong Kong Building Department, so that that regulation, that guideline to homeowners and developers on the, the act of subdivision, the act of creating these small units, can be made with much more conscious uh, knowledge and efforts. At the same time, we are working on a kind of public education campaign that really um, is targeted towards the residents who live in the subdivided units so that they understand how everyone has a, as a, as a, even the people who live in the subdivided units have a smartphone. So we're trying to have them teach them how to download apps that can, un, that can monitor the lighting facility and the air quality and ventilation of their own units.
So through this way, it's working from kind of top down, right, and from a regulation, but also try to provide knowledge and accessibility and an awareness of people who live in them. That is, the, I mean, that probably is the more significant and impactful part of this work we're trying to do in Hong Kong. Okay. Just one last question. I'm Pradnya Chauhan. Hello. And uh, the, the question that I'm trying to raise is as a comment and then a question. I have been to Singapore and also been to Hong Kong. And my daughter used to be there. And what I saw in Singapore was the houses were really very, very small. And there are lots of community spaces for eating. So eating out was the norm. Cooking in the house was exceptional. And therefore, when we start designing in India, even if a small unit of uh, 20 square meter, for example, will have a small kitchen. Whereas all these houses were extremely small, but the kitchen platform was what? I mean, just four feet by uh, one feet or two feet maximum. So therefore, I mean, can you comment on that? What is this uh, this tendency? Why, why, did, why did they get into this public eating spaces? And there's so many places where people would just go and eat. They hardly would cook in the house. Yeah. Uh, um, should we get two questions so we can try to address them together? Yeah. No, no, I, have, I think I have slightly different area of uh, concern. And it's a very simple question. I think it's rather simplified, simplistic. The, the, the question that comes to my mind is that when I look at Shenzhen, uh, what is it that given the current political dispensation, the kind of power that China has, the kind of vision it has about urbanization, how does it, I mean, I'm not saying that it's justified, but I'm just wondering, does it not have the power to kind of wipe it out, as what you're saying, yeah. and just rebuild? So what is it that is letting it be? Yeah. You know? I, um, yes, I mean, that is... That is very often the question I get. People are just so shocked that why in this wealthy planned city it's allowed to have these, you know, neighborhoods uh, that have so many illegally built housing that it would house 10 million people, right? Um, and my question to that is, and my answer, that that's the question, right? How was this... My question is about China. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I understand. Um, and, and very often, I think th this is why the, the urban villages became a fascinating research topic for me in the past 15 years, is by its very existence, it already defies misconceptions about China. It defies misconceptions about assumed urban processes, assumed political processes and assumed economic processes. So I can only say two ways. One, there are urban villages in every single city in China. However, in Shenzhen is the most, it houses the most significant proportion of the population. And I explained somewhat in that book and I really attribute to that, I attribute that to the fact that Shenzhen is a migrant city and in the way that even the policy makers locally in Shenzhen, they understand the necessity to work with the urban condition and not against it. And this is not because they were geniuses. <laughs> this is because um, they couldn't. They, they, you know, er, there were certainly acts of forced demolition that led to certain number of confrontations and what had happened is to the local political leaders who gave those orders, no, they no longer was supported in the city, right? So this is very different from what we understand of the Chinese governments, that it is somehow one person says X and every single process has to be that. And I have to, I want to tell you, this is not how China, in the last four decades, 
succeeded. This is, I mean, if this is, this is a really important thing because, I mean, we were in 2020, we have a world with centuries of knowledge about city making and governance and economics in front of us. There has never been a civilization and economy where strict top-down control and absolute decision making has been successful, but somehow, somehow, we are led to believe that this miracle happened in China. How could that be? It's against human nature. So this is why I felt compelled to have to write this book. It wasn't just about Shenzhen. I really felt compelled to have to share this um, quite pressurized thought is that we have been misled. And it may not have been intentional misleading because if we only look at the economic figures, if we only look at the hard drawn lines, it appears to be true. But I'm trying to show you, I hope, a little bit of evidence. And if you're interested, maybe read a little bit of the book, trying to provide the evidence that that's not exactly how it happened. And very quickly on the issue of Singapore. First of all, Singapore is very, very different from Hong Kong and Shenzhen, uh, and Singapore's public housing is very different. Singapore's public housing houses 95% of its population. It's very different, um, but they do have something in common with a lot of the Hong Kong housing that everybody eat out. Part of the reason why everybody eat out is that their homes are very small. Um, but the people who live in the subdivided units, most of them do not eat out because of eco economics. So they all have very small kitchens and sometimes shared kitchens in their very small homes. So this is why, um, this is why kind of this generalization is also a little bit problematic because when we look at different social sectors and different communities, they operate very differently. But you know, it's also a learning experience for me. So when we provide, when we worked on the um, friendship home for the homeless um, dwellers, we also made sure there was a kitchen in these small units because we learned from working for five years with residents in subdivided unit that active cooking not only is important economically, it was important socially. That maybe we had cases where, um, you know, 10 families shared one kitchen. so the single man who, the only single person who lived in that unit, he cooked for every single school children uh, that would come home earlier than their, than their, their mothers and fathers. So in, in this way, like if we didn't conduct this very in-depth intervention into the communities and really learn from the lived experiences how people live in there, we won't be able to, in the future, near future, I hope, give a policy recommendation to the Hong Kong Building Works for them to understand the importance of shared community spaces. So, um, so this is why I think cities are very different when we're looking from the outside <laughs> and, and versus from where we're looking from within. And so my work, I think in the past uh, decade and a half uh, is really, I've tried to kind of invert that and turn that inside out to say, let me show you the inner workings of these cities rather than um, just kind of the coating that usually one is presented with at the international context. Yeah, I think we should need to end really. But I think this is very strongly part of that question of the kitchen, you know, being um, sort of also not necessarily repeated within. I think, you know, you can see, I mean, Hong Kong, right? I've seen Hong Kong, it's this kind of culture of eating out. And I don't know if you're saying that the food is really not affordable outside, which is why people are going to eat outside. Are we then also erasing this larger ecology of home? But the kitchen may not necessarily be at home, but it may be the whole city. You know, I mean, we were discussing yesterday the question of what a home is. You know, to shift the better debate again from the idea of the house to the home, it, can the home be a larger ecology and not just really that the square meter area? Can the city constitute the home? And how then, you know, what, what are the languages of building that kind of home? Uh, is something that we can sort of think of and reflect on. But thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.